morning, church. What a blessing it is here! It is to be here today. Um, let's just um, uh, turn to God's word. Uh, it will be found in Psalm eighty-nine, five to nine. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging of the sea when it waves when its waves rise, and you still them. Uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to praise and thank you once again for this time that we have here, that we're here. Um, thank you for bringing um, those here to the congregation, Lord. Um, and also, um, thank you for those who are um, with us, Lord, through, um, through uh, technology. Oh, Lord, we just want to just um, praise you for just continuing just to be so merciful and just blessing us, Lord. Uh, continue to be with, um, with with everything going on right now in this world, with all the craziness, Lord. I just pray that at this time, people just turn to you, Lord God. Uh, people will just um, seek you out. Um, just pray, Lord, that you will just um, bring wisdom and guidance to those. Uh, Lord, right now, I just pray that as we're here, I pray that you will just do this as, um, as we worship your name. I just pray that we'll put all things aside, Lord, any distractions or anything, Lord, and just praise your name, Lord God, and just worship you. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you'll be a pastor as he preaches your word. I just pray, Lord, that um, you'll speak through him and he'll be your vessel. Thank you once again in your name. Amen. Let's all rise, please.
Now we come to this time where we, going, we are going to confess our faith together, and today we're going to recite from Romans chapter 3, verses 20 to 26, as this sweet reminder that we are saved by grace through faith. It is faith alone, that there is nothing that we can do. All we can do is receive, and as we just sung, it's nothing but the blood of Jesus and his perfect sacrifice for us. So that is what we're going to recite together, and then we're going to have a time of prayer of confession and thanksgiving as a church family. So let's recite these words from Holy Scripture, Romans chapter 3, 20 to 26. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Him as the mercy seat by His blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, as we have sung and as we have just recited and read from your word together, because you have commanded in your word to read scripture publicly, out loud. Father, we want to confess today, echoing Romans 3, that nobody is righteous before you on their own. Because fundamentally, we are all sinners without exception to the youngest of us, to the oldest of us, and everyone in between. We are sinners in your sight. And without Christ, as your word says, we do not fear you with awe and reverence. And without Jesus, we turn away from you and we seek after the worthless things of this world that so easily entangle us and 
take our eyes off of you. And without your son, we will not ever understand who you truly are, God. So Lord, we confess today the sin of forgetting your faithful love this past week and questioning whether you truly love us in Christ. Maybe that's some of us, Lord. We have done that this past week. And so we acknowledge before you that our hearts are prone to wander, as the hymn says, prone to leave the God we love. Lord, we also confess of the sin of not proclaiming your faithfulness to others when we have had opportunities this past week. Maybe we have forgotten to preach the gospel to ourselves and be reminded that we are saved by grace through faith alone. And we haven't followed Christ as faithfully as possible because we were too selfish or maybe we were too greedy or too full of bitterness and holding grudges in our hearts. So help us today, God, to acknowledge that we need your mercy, we need your grace, we need your love. But Lord, we also come before you to thank you. We thank you, Father, that you are faithful to forgive us in Christ. Thank you that we can sing today about your faithful love to every generation. There's power in the blood of Christ. Thank you that we are declared righteous through faith in Jesus. Thank you for the finished work of the cross. That's what we have been singing today. That takes away all of our shame, takes away all of our sin forever. And forever is forever. Thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus to pay the full and complete penalty and the just punishment for our sins. Thank you that on the cross, your holy wrath, your holy justice perfectly met your amazing love and your holy grace. Thank you that Jesus Christ has come. He came into this world to die for us sinners and to give us eternal life, eternal joy, eternal satisfaction. And thank you for the privilege today to worship you through singing, through praying, through the reading of your word, and also for the giving of our tithes and offerings. Father, thank you for this privilege. Thank you for Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. of grace is Jesus my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom 
Father, we just sunk. What are we without Christ? Without Christ, we have nothing. As we have sung, yet not I, but through Christ in us, in me. So may we celebrate that Jesus Christ is the source of all of our joy and the blessings in this life and the life after this one. We echo the words of Galatians 2.20 that we have been crucified with Christ. Father, at this time, we want to pray again for the country of Afghanistan. Lord, there's just, just a lot of crazy chaos going there. So, Father, uh, you know what's all going on there. I mean, nothing has taken you by surprise because you are the sovereign king of the universe on your throne. So there's nothing that has surprised you with the violence or <coughs> the, the evil and the death and the destruction that's been done by the Taliban that will probably be done in the future. Things going on done by the Taliban. And so we ask, God, that you would protect your people there. Protect your churches there. Please protect them from the coming persecution because it's probably coming. Please give them courage. Please give them wisdom, Lord, not to give up preaching the good news. Somehow, Lord, some way, may you bring Taliban fighters and the leaders of the Taliban and others there to a saving knowledge of you through faith in Jesus Christ. Somehow, God, do the work that only you can do bring people to saving faith to you, to you through Christ. May your good news, your gospel, so affect that country to bring about true peace that guns and tanks and rockets can never fully achieve. Father, your gospel is the good news that brings peace. So please, may it be faithfully proclaimed there. Father, so we ask for that. Father, we also ask for the people in Afghanistan for physical protection for everyone. Lord, as their evacuations happening, please just protect those evacuations, restrain the evil, confuse the plans of those who are planning to commit evil and harm, strengthen and protect and provide for those who need visas. Many others who are fleeing because they fear for their safety and the need to house and host refugees. Father, please watch over that process. Father, also that for those who follow you there, that you would just also spiritually provide. Please strengthen the faith there. Fill them with hope. Please may we as here in America just continue to remember our brothers and sisters there. Continue to pray for them. Continue to somehow, some way, any way possible to serve them. 
And Father, that you, again, you would advance your gospel there in and through those chaotic days. Father, we also want to pray for our own country as today on the East Coast in New York and New England areas, Hurricane Henry is landing and it's going to cause some destruction and, and loss of property. Father, we ask that you would protect everyone, that there would be no loss of life. Father, give wisdom to people so they would seek safety, that they would not try to be some crazy thrill seeker and be around the hurricane, but they would understand that this is immensely powerful and deadly. Father, please guide the government leaders there, not to play politics, but actually to make wise and good decisions for all the citizens and all the residents there. And please use your people, use your churches in those areas to be servants to all so that the gospel is clearly seen and then clearly proclaimed. And may this storm actually serve as a reminder to all of us that you are in total control of nature and the weather of this planet. Father, we also want to pray for all the teachers and principals and administrators and the staff and all the school districts throughout the Southern California area. Father, we pray for the believers who work in all the school districts so that they would continue to faithfully operate as salt and light with the truth of the gospel. We ask, Lord, that our brothers and sisters would take advantage of opportunities to love, to serve, and preach in Jesus' name so that students and others see the beauty of Jesus. Father, we pray for the many students there who are in classrooms or on Zoom, that they would hear the good news somehow, some way from classmates and teachers, and they would be saved. So God, please raise up a generation of Christ followers who love Jesus with all of their heart and soul and mind and strength. And please, Lord, protect those students who do follow Jesus today so that they would not be swayed by false teachings that seek to pull them away from you. Lord, we also want to pray for our church right now. Father, we lift up to you, uh, Sister Prudence, as she continues to recover. Father, thank you that uh, you've strengthened her and healed her, and we ask that continued strengthening and healing for her so that she may glorify you even more and that she would be such an encouragement to the rest of us. And may we as a church just follow her awesome example of faith and just continue to encourage her as well. May we support her, and may you continue to use her as a wonderful example. Father, we also want to lift up to you Sister Lisa as she undergoes surgery this Friday and, and all the preparations that she has been getting ready for. Lord, we ask, because you are God, we ask for complete and utter healing, that you would completely heal her, remove that cancer from her body. Father, even greater and better would be that you would remove it this week that so that she doesn't even need surgery. Father, because you are the God who can do that. But if in your will, Lord, you have decided to use surgery to heal her, please heal her. Give wisdom to the surgeons, the doctors, the nurses, all the medical professionals so that the surgery would be a success. Father, strengthen Sister Lisa grow her faith and her joy in you so that she may be a beacon of light and truth to everyone she interacts with at the hospital. Father, encourage her. May we as a church family continue to support her, encourage her, love her, and lift her up to you. Father, we also lift up to you uh, those members who haven't been able to rejoin us here in person due to health and safety reasons. Father, continue to watch over those brothers and sisters. May they be sweetly reminded that they are not forgotten by us, by the church, and for sure they have not been forgotten by you. And Father, may it be by your grace and mercy, sooner rather than later, that more and more of us can gather in person, see one another's faces, and just have that joy that we get to worship you together. Thank you for that. And Lord, now we turn to the preaching of your word. We ask that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that are open and ready to respond to your word. Father, your word is true. And when the Bible speaks, you speak. And so, Father, may we hear and listen and accept and respond to the glory of your name and for the increasing joy in our souls before you. This is all possible because of Jesus. His name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Let's take this time to say hello to one another. And I'll say hello. Make sure to say hello to those sitting in the back. And I'll say hello to those of you watching 
online. Hopefully soon we can see you in person. Um, if you're a guest or a visitor, thanks for joining. Uh, we would be thrilled with the opportunity to get to know you, so please do talk to us, contact us. We would, really would love to hear your story, and hopefully you would want to hear ours as well. Now, if you have a Bible, I pray that you do. I hope we all have access to a Bible, either a paper version or an e-version. Let's turn today to Mark chapter 2 in the New Testament, Mark chapter 2. So as you're going there, I have a lot of announcements to share today, like a lot. I think this is the most I've ever shared on one day, so bear with me. I got a lot of announcements. Okay, first announcement, next Sunday, after this, the morning worship gathering, there is a members meeting in the breezeway, so out here, uh, for our members. So if you're a member of this church, pretty sure you know who you are, we have a meeting, get updates, pray for members. Uh, light lunch will also be served, and so uh, we have a members meeting next week. Okay, next announcement, second. Next Saturday at 9 a.m. out in San Bernardino, all the way out there, so just take 210, go east. There is a Christian Life and Wellness course offered by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, so if you're interested in any way in this or you want more info, please contact Brother Mondo Bayan, and he will help you out with that. Okay, third announcement. Speaking of witnessing, so this Friday at 4 p.m., we're going to have another Friday outreach at Victory Park. Victory Park, we're going to be meeting 4 p.m. in the afternoon at the Children's Playground. We're going to meet there first, pray, and then we're just going to fan out, walk around, and see if we can talk to people. And if, if possible, be able to share. So if you have any questions on that, please let me know. If you plan to join, please let me know as well. Okay, the slides already changed, so we'll go to the next announcement. So we've been doing our Wednesday Bible study, going through the Baptist faith and message. It's continuing this Wednesday, 7 p.m. Last week, we began reading and discussing and learning about the doctrine of God, uh, and then starting this, uh, and then we're going to continue on on the doctrine of God, focusing on the Trinity, God the Father, this Wednesday uh, at 7. In-person fellowship hall. It's not too late to join. If you'd like to join, please please join. Uh, we have workbooks for everybody. All right, next announcement. Uh, I was asked to do, share this. So some of the ladies, the sisters, will be starting or resuming, restarting a ladies Bible study Thursday, starting Thursday, September 16th, using a curriculum from Lifeway going through the book of James. That's actually written by uh, Pastor Matt Chandler, who's down in Dallas, Texas, Southern Baptist pastor. If you have any questions on this, please contact Sister Norma Byan. She'll give you more info on that. Okay, moving on. As was mentioned last week, uh, Brother Tubi Rayner, he's going to be facilitating, he has the keyword facilitating, Financial Peace University, this class, uh, in terms of just kind of thinking more holistically about finances and money and stewardship, it's going to start September 22nd. Uh, there is a link that you, if you want to participate to register, and then you have to pay for a subscription so that you can obtain the materials for the class. If you have any questions, please contact Tubi. All right, announcement seven. Our church will host, will, starting next month, we're going to be a host location for what's called a Good News Club, which is an outreach uh, part of Child Evangelism Fellowship, also known as CEF. They have a local branch here in Pasadena. So CEF uh, targets schools and students to reach out to them with the good news. So our church is going to, it's blessed to be able to be a host location to students at Webster Elementary. So our next door neighbor right here. So starting September 16th, uh, we are, it's gonna be a weekly thing. There's going to be a good news club here. So this is not just for students at Webster. This is open to all kids. And so if you're interested at all, want, if you want to register a kid, uh, if, especially if you're a parent, uh, please let me know or please let Sister Norma know and we can give you more information on that. Or let's say if you want to help out with this Good News Club, uh, please let us know as well. Okay, that leads to announcement number eight is that today after our worship gathering, worship service, we are going to have a training for our children's ministry volunteers in preparation to resume Children's Sunday School, which will resume on Sunday, September 19th. 
I know I'm just throwing all these dates in September out to everybody. And you're like, I'm not going to remember this. It's okay. Uh, I'll probably send an email with it later this week. Uh, September 19th, Sunday, we began children's Sunday school. So this is for elementary pre-K to, to fifth grade. And so for our volunteers, there's a training today. We'll be, we'll be eating lunch together, receiving some training. So, but here's the thing. It's not too late to serve and help. So if you still want to, if you're interested in helping, please come on out. Join for lunch, join for the training, and then there's going to be one more training next month before we resume Sunday school for our kids. Finally now, our last announcement, number nine, is that we are continuing in our sermon series through the Gospel of Mark. So if you remember from last week, we saw that Jesus can make anybody clean. He can do that. The man with leprosy, the leper, he approached Jesus in faith. He begged Jesus to clean him. And as an object lesson for the deeper cleaning from sin that we all need, Jesus cleans this man. He basically does what? Mentioned last week, he switches places with this man. So he basically absorbs, takes this man's sin, this man's disease upon himself, and in return in this switch, this exchange, he gives this man love and mercy and grace and a transformed new life so it's utterly remarkable what jesus does for this man correct i mean it's crazy and then this man does what he doesn't really follow what jesus says in verse 45 of mark chapter 1 he goes out and he spreads the news of what jesus did for him so this is good great news isn't it jesus can make anyone clean anyone But since we live in a Genesis 3 world, still live in this world, not all news is good news. We hear, we know about bad news that goes on every week. Now, unless you have been completely off the grid, or you are so totally, completely engrossed in yourself, in your own life, I'm certain that all of us here, those of you watching online too, we have heard and seen the news about What's going on in Afghanistan, right, on the other side of the world, right? There are some pictures and images you're thinking, oh my goodness, what's going on? So we all know, right, the Taliban, the guys who hosted Al-Qaeda years ago, they have overthrown the previous government. They're the new governors. They're the new rulers. And now there is a massive refugee and humanitarian crisis. If not, then why are people trying, are clinging on to U.S. Air Force planes? So it's what? You look at the pictures, no matter what you're hearing from certain people in Washington, D.C., it's terrible and horrible what's going on. You can't sugarcoat it. And a question that's been on many people's minds is what is the Taliban going to do now that they have seized power? How will they treat those who are on the other side against them? How will these uh, victors interact with their defeated opponents. Now, apparently, the Taliban is offering what they call, they're offering forgiveness and amnesty to Afghans who fought against them and Afghans who supported the American government and military and the Western allies. They're offering forgiveness and amnesty. So, for example, here's what a Taliban spokesman said Uh, about this offer of forgiveness to the Evening Standard, a a news news organization. It'll be on the screen. He says this, or he said this, we don't want to repeat any conflict, any war again, and we want to do away with the factors for conflict. Animosities have come to an end, and we would like to live peacefully. We don't want any internal enemies and any external enemies. Okay. And... There are news reports (coughs) that certain Afghan people are handing out red and white roses to Taliban soldiers. Okay, why are they doing that? Well, in Afghani culture, red symbolizes friendship, white symbolizes forgiveness. So for those folks who are not attempting to flee the country, they are trying to extend friendship to the Taliban and ask for forgiveness from them. Now, time will tell uh, whether there's going to be forgiveness, although history and other news reports 
show that this forgiveness probably won't last very long. I'm just making a guesstimate. But here's the thing, I was just kind of thinking, just kind of reading and watching all this new stuff and getting frustrated about what I'm seeing and then complaining to my wife. I wonder if we can ask this question, right? Hearing about the Taliban's gonna offer forgiveness and amnesty. Can the Taliban truly forgive those who are against them? Okay, some of you saying no. Or here's another question, is forgiveness even a category in their theology and their worldview? Here's a more important question. Who can forgive? Right? Who owns the power to forgive? Who owns the author- authority to forgive wrongs done against them? How is forgiveness even possible? Right? We look at the world. How is forgiveness even possible? And there's a lot of wickedness and violence and justice evil in our world. What's the point of forgiveness? Right? Maybe we should just follow Darwinian evolution. The strongest survive. Now, remember from last week, Jesus has been preaching and teaching all around the Sea of Galilee. He's doing this tour. And this tour is highlighted when he meets the man with leprosy. So if we go back up to Mark 1, 41, it says this, moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Verse 42, immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. So in a certain sense, Jesus has offered forgiveness to this man through his cleaning. And the cleaning is both inner and outer transformation. That's what Jesus is getting at. Now, as we head into chapter 2 of Mark, Mark the author, the guy who's writing this, he doesn't want us to forget that Jesus is different. So he wants us to remember again that Jesus is God. So let's go to verse 1. When he, Jesus, entered Capernaum again after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So let's stop there. So Jesus returns to home base, which is literally Simon and Andrew's home, his house. We see that in Mark 1. So it's safe to assume he's been traveling. He wants some rest. He wants to rest from his travels. He, he's been out in the desert areas, rocky, wilderness, going to a house. I mean, that's a nice break. Right, going home, maybe Simon's mother-in-law will even give him some home-cooked meals. Yum, 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 yum. So that's going to be good, right? But then the news spreads, as it says here, and another crowd starts to gather at this location. Verse 2, so many, so many people gathered together that there was no more room, not even in the doorway, and he was speaking the word to them. <coughs> so all sorts of people from even outside the town, have invited themselves over. They didn't receive an invitation. They invited themselves over to the house. So this includes people who are really genuinely interested. Like, man, I really want to know about this Jesus guy. So they're wondering, should I follow this guy? But then there are probably other people who are hoping to see another miracle magic show. They want to see the laser lights. Right? There's no Las Vegas there, so I want to see a show. I want to be entertained by this Jesus. This is a free show. Maybe I'll even get a meal because I'm at this house. And then later on, we're going to see that there are Jewish religious leaders there too. And they're there because they've heard about this Jesus phenomenon. They want to see what this is all about. They want to see with their own two eyes. Now, some scholars say that at most... 50 people were crammed into this house. 50 people. Which means what? That everyone else is outside. They're outside, looking through the doorway, so the doorway is jammed, and, they, and then they're looking through the window. So every opening to the house, there's, there are people there. There's a mob surrounding Jesus. He didn't even invite them. And I'm sure Simon's mother-in-law is thinking, how are we going to feed all these people? Okay, so what's Jesus doing it says in verse 2 he's not shooing people away he doesn't call the fire marshal get rid of these people he's what it says he's speaking the word to them he's what he's preaching the good news so rather than get some r and r jesus is again preaching he's saying the good news he wants everyone to repent and believe 
He's offering the joy of forgiveness to anyone who truly desires to be forgiven. And while he's preaching the good news, and he's teaching from the scriptures, the Old Testament, weirdness comes into the scene. Weirdness. Verse 3. They came to him, bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. Verse 4. Since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after digging through it, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. So we don't know why this man is paralyzed. Doesn't say. But we do know that he has four friends or four relatives who really love him a lot. How do we know that they really love this paralyzed man? They literally carry him on a mat, on a stretcher to go see Jesus. There's no ambulance there. They're the ambulance. But what happens when they get to the house? It's crowded. So there's no way to get inside. So they what? They, they are holding him. They're attempting to, they're trying to push their way in. You know, they, maybe they're saying this, beep, 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 right? Paralyzed man coming through. Let us in. Okay, that doesn't work. Okay, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, this house has an ADA spot inside. Please let us in. Please let us in. That doesn't work. Hey, please have some compassion. This guy can't stand. How can he see Jesus? So you got to let us inside so he can go see Jesus. But what does it say here? Nobody moves for them. And now, probably, this outside crowd, they're getting annoyed by these five people, by this paralytic and his friends, right? Like, stop talking to me. Like, I want to listen to this guy. So then, for this paralyzed man and his four friends, should they call it quits? Should they just go home? come back the next morning and try again because it's probably been an exhausting day carrying him from wherever they've come from and no one is giving any aid to them no one's helping them out they are basically invisible to the crowd they are being neglected but then they call an audible this house has a flat roof it's a flat roof which means what that this family Simon and Andrew's fan, they are using the roof for storage, for drying their laundry, for eating. The roof of this house and many roofs of houses at that time basically are like how a lot of people use their patios, balconies, and decks. Go outside, have a cookout, and all that kind of stuff. And so if the roof is flat and the family goes up there, well, that means what? You can access it. You can go up there. So the four friends start doing it. They start looking around. They find a ladder. They carefully and gently lift their friend up onto the roof. And then it says in verse 4, what? They start digging. Like, what? Why? What? What? what, what? Digging? Well, the roofs of houses at that time were constructed not of cement or bricks. They were made of branches, sticks, grass, and mud kind of filled up with mud. So think of, right, if you want to imagine this, a thick lawn on top of a house. That's what's going on. And since it's all earthy material, these men start what? They start digging through the roof. Because if they can't get in through the doorway, if they can't get in through a window, by golly, we're going to go come through the top. We're going to make our way in. We're going to unroof the roof for free for this family. So at this point, right, Jesus is teaching, and then they start hearing noise, right? There's pounding, there's digging, there's shoveling, and for sure, because that's happening, what's falling down? Debris. So everyone on the inside is getting dirty, right? It's now, now it's getting, probably getting harder to breathe. Now, if this is your house, right, this is Simon and Andrew's house, you might be now saying a few choice words to those guys upstairs. What are you doing? You're devaluing my house. You're going to pay me back? You're going you're gonna to re-mud my house for me? Okay, and then after a large enough hole has been created, it's been carved out, and now the sun is shining through the top, this paralyzed man, the four friends, they gently lower him in front of Jesus. But what now? Well, verse 5, 
Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Son, your sins are what? Forgiven. Wait a second. What? Is Jesus being a cruel jerk? I mean, does he not care about this man's physical condition? Doesn't Jesus know that these men have come to him for what? They want the paralyzed man to be healed. They've heard about him healing. They didn't ask for forgiveness. Did they say that? Hey, forgive me. And here's the thing. They're meeting Jesus for the first time. So what sins did they do against Jesus that would require forgiveness? What did they do against him? I mean, doesn't that sound all wrong? Right? Your sins are forgiven? I mean, if you're in the crowd there, you probably like want to say, hey, 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 Jesus, Jesus, there's a paralyzed dude in front of you. Right? Please heal him. You know, you did that with the leper dude. This guy's paralyzed. Heal him. What's the fundamental problem for all humanity? It's not access to adequate health care. It's not, the fundamental problem is not the fight for a livable wage or equal rights or proper education. It's not melting glaciers or rising temperatures. None of those are the most fundamental problem. More important than health, more important than wealth, more valuable than prosperity is a right relationship with God. So the fundamental issue for every single human being on this planet is that everybody's a sinner. No exceptions. So, just to, not to, well, little Ava there is a sinner. Noah is a sinner. Other babies are sinners. Everybody's a sinner. We all have a sin problem And the same goes for this paralyzed man. So Jesus, forgiving this paralytic, bypasses the need to be healed. The need to be healed. Jesus is looking past the external outside, the physical condition of this man, and his immediate need, right? He needs to, he wants to be healed. He is paralyzed. That is a need. But instead, he's looking past that, through that, into peering into this man's soul and drawing out the deepest, most important need for him. Now, as I mentioned last week, this doesn't mean that we don't care about suffering and abuse and hurt in our world. No, as Christians, we ought to care about that, of course. I mean, anybody with a beating heart, right, should be feeling for the people in Afghanistan. We should care about that. I mean, suffering and pain is probably coming for them if it hasn't already. And so we should, what, keep praying for peace and for refugees to be helped. And in fact, in terms of helping refugees, the SEND network of the SVC is actively helping and working with other organizations in the government to resettle Afghan refugees in this country. But as good and as important as all that is, Christianity is not ultimately about fulfilling felt needs or providing some psychological therapy. That's not what Christianity is. Churches are not meant to be places for political commentary or outposts solely for social work. Because if if that's what I think Christianity and churches are all about, then I am sorely mistaken. Okay? Maybe I need to say this. No, I'm going to say, okay, Christianity is not beholden to a political party or a certain politics. If my thinking of a church is we are all of a certain political persuasion, that's not fundamentally what Christianity and the church is. We do not have a home in any political party. Maybe someone's offended by offended that, but I got it. That is the truth. We are not beholden to any political party or any politics. We have our own politics. It's from the Bible. No party has everything what the Bible said. They're all flawed. They're all sinners. So friends and family, all the sickness, all the death, all the destruction, all the violence in our world is a result of sin. Sin is the cause. And we can do all the outer healing and cleaning that we want. We can try, but that can't wash away our sins. That cannot address our ultimate need for forgiveness as sinners. 
I mean, you can try. I can try to remove all the guilt, all the shame as best as possible. I can try, but that's not going to work in the end. And here's the thing, even healing the physical and the here and now will still lead to future sickness and death. It will. That's why forgiveness needs to come first. So who can forgive? The answer is who? Jesus. Jesus can forgive, and he says that. Your sins are forgiven. All right, so we're good, right? Back to the Bible study he was doing, the preaching. Well, forgiveness always brings a response. Verse 6. But some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So these teachers, scribes of the Jewish law, they're the religious leaders. They are there to hear Jesus. They're probably assessing, they're trying to grade him on how good of a teacher he is. And now they hear him what? They they hear him forgiving this paralytic. So they start thinking to themselves. That's what verse 6 is saying. What? Forgiveness? It's blasphemy. That's heresy. Fake news. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And you know what? That's the right question. Who can forgive? Jesus says that he can forgive, but can he? I mean, is he jumping above his spiritual pay grade, going above his authority? Because ultimately, because these scribes are right, only God alone can truly forgive sins. Every, and here's the thing, every other forgiveness flows out from, so when we f- try to forgive each other, every other forgiveness flows out from God's unique power to forgive. For example, Psalm 32, 5 says this, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And then Exodus 34 says this, The Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. So what's going on with Jesus forgiving and the scribes complaining? Well, here's the equation. If Jesus or excuse me, if God alone can forgive sins, and Jesus is claiming to forgive sins, two plus two equals four, Jesus is saying what? He's God. And Jesus is also saying that every single sin in the whole wide world is first against him. It's ultimately all sin is against him. Now, of course, people sin against each other all the time. We're not denying that. We all have been Right, the law, as we live life, we have all been a recipient of someone else's sin. People have sinned against us, correct? Yeah. And here's the thing, though. We have all sinned directly against someone else, correct? So if you are living with somebody, there's a good chance that last week you sinned against each other. And every married couple says, yes, amen. And parents too. And kids. But since God created the universe, every violation, every breaking of his perfect standards is what? Sin against him. As David says in Psalm 51, against you alone have I sinned. He's talking about his sin against Bathsheba and Uriah and everyone else. And here's the thing. We read this earlier in Romans 3, right? All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone has sinned. So Jesus is telling everyone there, he's telling all of us today, here and watching online, that he is God in the flesh. And not only is he making this outrageous claim, he shows that he most definitely is God. Verse 8, right away. Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves and said to them, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Verse 9, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, 
or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. Okay, these scribe guys didn't say a word, right? They didn't say anything, but Jesus knows exactly what they're thinking, what they're muttering in their minds about him. And so he calls them out publicly with a riddle. He says what? He asks, which is easier? Okay, so what's the answer to this question? What's the easier action that Jesus, what's the easier of the two? Well, on one level, both are easy, right? I mean, it's easy to speak words. Anybody can speak the words. Be healed. Be forgiven. Anybody can say it. So that's easy, but practically speaking, which is easier? It's easier to forgive, isn't it? Practically speaking. Because I'm certain nobody here has the power to heal paralyzed people with their own words. If you've got that supernatural spiritual ability, you need to quit your day job and go about healing. Now, we can't always see if someone has their sins forgiven, right? Because it's usually invisible. It's really impossible to disprove. You're forgiven. But we can for sure see if a paralyzed man is healed, correct? But here's the deeper level of the riddle. Jesus is saying that it's actually easier to heal. Forgiveness is much, much, much more difficult because forgiving sins requires an authority that no mere human being possesses. So who can forgive sins? Well, only God truly can, right? And then Jesus is saying that he owns that authority. So verse 10. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, He told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Okay, so what's the logic here that Jesus is saying? Since Jesus can accomplish the visible miracle of healing paralysis, this is the loud and clear proof and evidence that he can do the invisible miracle of forgiving sins. That's what Jesus is getting. So Jesus is saying he owns both the authority to heal externals and he owns the authority to forgive he's saying i got it all so who can forgive sins jesus jesus can forgive sins and jesus is god okay but then in verse 11 or excuse me 10 why does he call himself the son of man right what is that right is he all is he trying to be all mysterious and suave refer to himself in the third person that you know like those people who try to be all cool and call call themselves by a certain name is that what he's doing well listen to what daniel 7 says daniel 7 13 and 14 i continued watching in the night visions and suddenly one like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven he approached the ancient of days and was escorted before him he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people nation and language should serve him His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. So Jesus is pointing to this place in the Old Testament, and here's the irony with him referring to himself as the son of man, saying, I'm that guy in Daniel 7. The irony is that the man on the mat, on the stretcher, he's not the only one who's paralyzed. Who else is paralyzed here? Well, specifically here in Mark 2, it's the scribes, the religious leaders. They are also paralytics. These men who have criticized Jesus are just as paralyzed as the disabled man. These religious leaders, okay, they're not physically paralyzed, but they are what? Spiritually paralyzed. Their paralysis by analysis has left them blind to the truth. And what's the truth? Well, Jesus says it in verse 10. So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. That's what he wants them to know. So Jesus wants these men, he wants everybody, all of us included, to know in our minds and in our hearts, minds and hearts, 
that he, Jesus, is the God of the Old Testament who has the authority to forgive sins. And after he tells the paralyzed man to get up, because that's what he says at the end of verse 11, we see how this man responds to Jesus in faith. Verse 12. Immediately, he got up, took the mat, and went out in front of everybody. Everyone. All right, so then what's the main point, the main truth that Mark wants to get out from us, wants us to know from today's verses? Jesus forgives sins. Right? Jesus forgives sins. How so? Well, we've seen all throughout Mark so far because he's the son of man. He's the holy one of God because he is the son of God. And so if we want to expand this main point further, we could say it this way. Jesus is God and forgives sins. Jesus is God and forgives sins. So this hurting and paralyzed man receives so, so much more than what he and his friends were expecting. Because they thought what? They thought they knew their deepest needs. But they were wrong. Jesus showed them what? Their ultimate need for the full forgiveness of sins. That's what he's showing them. Now, if we're honest, right? If we, let's, let's put this on ourselves. If we're honest, many times we know, we think we know what we need from God. So we come every Sunday, maybe this is a few, we come every Sunday expecting Jesus to meet some relevant need in my life that I'm experiencing today. You know, maybe I need, I need to fill that need. Maybe I have a problem with my family, with my spouse and my kids and my parents. Maybe the need or the problem or the issue is my job or my school, and I need to hear something about that today. Or maybe the issue is financial or emotional or something very real in our lives. So that's what we come on a Sunday expecting or when we read the Bible. So then we, like, flip open the Bible. Right, expecting some need to be filled, or we expect, right, I, on a Sunday, want the specific need to be filled. So we want the words of Scripture to soothe our aches and pains and sadness to my real-life problems. And I got real-life problems. Because, right, we live in a sinful world, we all got problems. We all got problems here in this room. But as important as all of those needs are, and they are all important, the most essential need is what? For us to know Christ, Jesus Christ, is the God who forgives sins. That's the most important need. We need Jesus more than anything else that this world or anyone else has to offer. We need Jesus. We need him and his forgiveness of sins. That's the most fundamental need. Okay, so then what should we do in response to Jesus? Since he forgives sins, as it says here, how do we apply this truth in our lives? Well, here's one way. Give glory to God and speak the good news. Give glory to God and speak the good news. The end of verse 12 says what? As a result, they were all astounded and gave glory to God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So church family, if I don't think that forgiveness is all that important, then I probably don't think that sin is that big of a deal. And if that's the case, I might start thinking that I don't need to be forgiven of anything. Right? A Christian understands that he or she needs forgiveness constantly. So if anyone says, I don't need forgiveness, they are not a Christian. Because I've heard people say that, and then like, well, that person's a Christian. No, he's not. But here's the thing. If I understand truly that I am a sinner in desperate need of forgiveness, if I experience the true joy of forgiveness, wouldn't I be thankful? Shouldn't I give credit where credit is due? Wouldn't I fervently desire in my heart to speak this good news? Shouldn't I echo the words from the end of verse 12? We have never seen anything like this. And for sure, 
we can amen these words from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 3. My soul, bless the Lord, and all that is in within me, bless his holy name. My soul, bless the Lord, and do not forget all his benefits. He forgives all your iniquity, your sins. He heals all your diseases. So glory to his name. And to be super specific now on this, I'm going to say this as I said two weeks ago. Come join. This Friday, 4 p.m., Victory Park for the outreach. Right? Take advantage of this opportunity. It's carved, it's scheduled to go and speak the good news and give glory to God. Because if Jesus has forgiven my sins, I can speak and share with joy. I can do it. I can be one second old as a Christian, I can still share. And this leads to a second way. Forgive as forgiven people. Forgive as forgiven people. Now, in Matthew 18, Simon Peter and Jesus have a conversation about forgiveness. So Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Okay, what does he mean by that? He basically is telling Peter to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive because forgiving someone has no expiration date. Okay, let's be honest now. This is ridiculously difficult. Okay, anyone think it's easy to forgive people all the time? Come on, right? One of the guys in the back was joking. He's about to put up his hand. Now, come on, forgive somebody? Forgive someone even if they have never apologized to me and they've never accepted responsibility. I'm still supposed to forgive them? And so maybe one or two of us, you're not liking what I'm saying right now, Right? I've been wrong. I've been hurt. You don't know what's been going on in my life. You're an idiot for saying this. That's so callous against me. You're hurting me. All this stuff. How can I forgive people who have sinned against me and not acknowledge that they have done wrong? I know I've thought these thoughts before. And you know what? I still wrestle with this in my heart. Because I can hold a grudge. You can ask my wife. I can hold a grudge. Now, of course, we don't dismiss the hurts and the pains and the evils that people experience. Right? We're not just throw it away. No. We acknowledge the abuses. Right? We call out the sins as we see them. But as Jesus' followers, we are what? Still called to forgive, aren't we? And if I can't forgive, you know what's going on? If I cannot forgive, I am actually robbing myself of joy, and I am distorting my own life. I heard this quote from another pastor. Uh, It won't be on the screen, but I'll read it twice. Here's a quote I found. Bitterness is the poison you drink, hoping the other person will drop dead. Say it, read it again. Bitterness or grudges, they are the poison you drink, hoping the other person will drop dead. Louis Zamperini, right, who has an airport named after him down in Torrance, Gardena, he was an Olympic athlete who then later was drafted to fight in World War II against the Japanese Empire. Okay? And his real life story is that what? He was captured by the Japanese. He was sent to a prison camp. He was mercilessly tortured by this one guard. And then this guard escaped. And then Zamperini was rescued along with his other soldiers and sailors. And then after the war, his life was an utter mess. Right? He had all this trauma, all this pain, hurt. And his marriage was at the breaking point until Jesus saved him. And because of Jesus, Mr. Zamperini then went back to Japan looking for the man who directly tortured him and then actually wrote a letter to this man, this Japanese gentleman. And so I'm going to read a part of this letter that he wrote to this man that he left for him. Under your discipline, it'll be on the screen, under your discipline, my rights, not only as a prisoner of war, 
but also as a human being, were stripped from them. It was a struggle to maintain enough dignity and hope to live until the war's end. The post-war nightmares caused my life to crumble, but thanks to a confrontation with God, I committed my life to Christ. Love replaced the hate I had for you. Christ said, forgive your enemies and pray for them. So LRC family, if I can admit that I'm a sinner in need of forgiveness, if I can confess that I need the love of Jesus, then I can humbly forgive others who have wronged me. And then my heart will be opened up to greater joy, greater peace, greater happiness. So here's the question for all of us. Is there someone I need to forgive today? If so, how will I pray? And do I need to go talk to that individual? Ephesians 4.32 says this, And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. So how do we really ultimately receive this forgiveness of sins from Jesus? Right? What's the starting point for us to be able to forgive others and to give God glory? Well, here's the third and final way. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Let's go back to verse 5. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. You know what's interesting about this verse? It says what? Jesus sees their faith. The faith of the five men. Because it says their, not your or his. Their faith. Five men. So let's think about how Jesus interacts with this paralyzed man. Does he condemn him? No. He is what? He is tender. He is compassionate to a man who badly needs help, desires it. This guy doesn't even ask for forgiveness with spoken words. He doesn't say it, but Jesus being God, he's already reading and seeing this person's heart. He knows this man is yearning for a mercy that he can't even express. Right? He's in front of Jesus. He doesn't even know what to say. But he and his friends are what? They believe in Jesus. And Jesus is eager to love and bless this man. How do we know that? He calls him what? Son. Not you. He says, son. Isn't he compassionate and caring to this man? So if Jesus cares that much to forgive this paralyzed man, and if Jesus offers the same great gift of forgiveness to everybody, why not trust Jesus? Why not trust him more and more? Why not repent of my sins, believe that Jesus is the God who forgives all of my sins, all of my past sins, all of my current and present sins, all of my future sins from today? He, is, he forgives that too. And how do we know that he can and he does forgive? Well, the good news that we share is what? That Jesus became paralyzed for sinners on the cross. He what? He willingly lowered himself into the hell of sin, the pit, to absorb the full punishment for sinners. He accepted the ultimate paralysis, which is what? Death. To what? Heal and forgive. That's not all, right? The good news also is what? Three days later, he got up. He walked, got up from the grave, walked out of the tomb, just like this paralyzed man got up and walked out of the house, and Jesus went home to heaven. And one day, what do we believe? What do we know? He's coming back. And sin will be ended forever. But today, he says to everyone, Repent and believe the good news. And through faith that Jesus is God who forgives sins, we then hear these words from today. Son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Now I have to say this. 
right now, if you are not a Jesus follower, right, you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian, you're not a Christian, the opportunity is here right now for you to repent of your sins and believe this good news. This is good news. Jesus offers you, friend, true forgiveness. True forgiveness if you believe. Just receive in faith. This is what the most important decision that you will ever make in your life. Because that's a truth from the Bible. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. You've got to ask. Now, Christian sisters and brothers, this is something for all of us, right? Let's not be paralyzed like the condescending scribes who, think, who thought they didn't need any forgiveness, right? There's no joy in being uptight and arrogant and self-righteous like these men. And we can all fall into this trap. Let's instead do what? Let's learn from the example of this paralyzed man who was set free. Now, maybe one or two of us are feeling that we are too paralyzed to go to Jesus. I can't approach him. Right? I have horrible sins. Or maybe you think that Jesus possibly couldn't accept you. Why would he want to love me? But if you have faith, he sees you, sister. If you have faith, he knows your heart, brother. And just like the paralytic, we can ask others to help us. Why? Because Jesus is always willing and ready to forgive. Amen? I'll end by reading a few verses to encourage us to keep following Jesus. Psalm 103, verse 8 to 13. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever. He has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to go through these first 12 verses of Mark chapter 2. Father, help us to remember and celebrate again that Jesus is God and forgives sins. Father, what a glorious truth that is. What a glorious reminder that is. Lord, so for any of us here today, who needs this word of comfort, whatever is going on in our lives, help us to remember again and believe again through repentance and faith that Christ forgives us and he continues to forgive us. And we know this is true because of the cross. That is the objective evidence that Jesus loves us, that you love us, Lord. Father, also, maybe there's one or two of us that we are har our hearts are hardened we don't think we need forgiveness. Maybe we've heard this message today and we think, I already know all this. Right? Why do I need to hear this again? Father, if that's any one of us, please break the hardness of our hearts. Father, because if we truly know what forgiveness is all about, how can we have hardened hearts? So break us, Lord, and mold us to be more like your son and to forgive as we have been forgiven. Thank you so much for this good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What mercy was revealed, what selflessness and
Thank you everyone for joining in this worship gathering to worship our Lord and Savior that anyone who calls upon his name they will be saved and we can say an amen to that well, let's take this time to end with a closing prayer so let's all stand together here even if you're at home let's stand too let's have a closing prayer and then a final scripture reading from Hebrews 13 Father as we have just sung anyone who calls upon the name of Jesus is saved that through faith we are forgiven of all of our sins, past, present, and future. That is the crazy good news of the gospel, that there is nothing that we can do to earn salvation or forgiveness. There is nothing even after being saved and receiving forgiveness that we can do to earn more or to do or to keep doing something that you would that would cause you to love us and forgive us less. No. Because of the cross, because of Christ's perfect sacrifice, all of our sins are forgiven through faith in Christ. And if we call upon the name of Christ, we are saved again and again and again and again and again. So Lord, help us to live in that freedom this week. Help us to share this good news, give you glory. Help us to repent and believe and help us, Lord, even if it might feel uncomfortable, to forgive others because we have been forgiven first by you. Thank you, Lord, for this glorious good news that you love us so much. Now hear this reading from Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with everything good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight, 
through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. And every believer says, amen. Have a blessed and wonderful week. We'll see you next Sunday. Thank you.